and all the responsibilities. Alhamdulillah, yeah, it's been nice. It's, uh, I think, much easier than previous years. Oh, think, really? Yeah, we had like a summer, I think, where we were we were breaking our fast at like 10 o'clock. Okay. After that, anything is easy. Anything, anything becomes easy after that, for sure. Alhamdulillah. What about you? Are you, um, where are you right now? And, and are you in London? I'm in, I'm in the UK. Oh. Um, yes. Yeah, and we we were hoping you would have come to Birmingham because you did go to Manchester, right? And I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow, inshallah, to Manchester. Oh, uh, yeah, it would have been nice to have you, but our programs here in Birmingham are so packed. <laughs> Subhanallah, it's 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 completely fine. Uh, but I'm very happy that we could be with you uh, virtually, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start, inshallah. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining our session. Ramadan Mubarak to you all. Um, just before we start the session, I'll just recite quickly um, the surah and we'll make a start, inshallah. Allah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr laylatul qadr khayrun min alf shah tanazzalu al-malaa'ikatu wa ar-ruuhu fiha bi'idni rabbihim min kulli am salamun hiya hatta mat'a al-fajr um sadaqallahu al-'aliyya al-'azim so thank you everyone for joining lantern of lights uh, session inshallah um sorry can you all hear me yeah, okay. There's just someone I think that says that they can't hear. Um, okay. So inshallah, um, this session, we are really happy to host Sister Saha Jabbar, who graduated with a double, on double honors in communication and sociology from McMaster University. She currently resides in Lebanon, where she is completing her Islamic Hausa studies. She is the co-founder of Figs and Olives Publication, a publishing, a publishing house with a focus on Islamic books and literature. She also runs a hijab mentorship program and workshops for females struggling with their hijab and for their growth. And so we're very excited to host you, inshallah, today discussing a very important topic. Um, and I'm very excited to hear um, everything that you have to say, inshallah, and hear from you. So thank you very much. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it's never easy in uh, the month of Shahar Ramadan to put time aside uh, to actually just you know go through everything and uh, listen to lectures so it's just such a pleasure um feel free if you'd like to um join whenever and Charlie we will have a conversation in the end um to the best of our abilities uh inshallah in today's discussion um it's one of those where I really do hope and appreciate it if we tackle the concept of feminism in a very new approach, rather than uh, on taking feminism to what we understand um, from our day to day, let's try to understand feminism based on, um, you know, an outside perspective, like moving away from the box and trying to then analyze feminism. As uh, Sister said, Lena says, Sister Lena said, um, I studied sociology in Canada um, in about. It was about 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Honestly, I, I can't even remember when I went to university. Um, and I remember for those, uh, you know, for the four years that I studied my undergraduate, feminism at that time, sociology at that time is completely different than sociology right now. Sociology at that time was really focused on, again, feminism, um, uh, again, between men and women. Now, you know, sociology has a lot more to do with the LGBTQ plus uh, society and all of that. Um, and even when you are talking about feminism, you can't really talk about it too much without um, being afraid to offend anyone by talking about someone's gender, etc. But what's really interesting about feminism is how diverse it is, even though there's a co and co, you know, one singular idea, which is equality for women bring two feminists in a room and they will not agree with one another. It doesn't matter how many feminists you put into one room, not a single one will actually agree with one another or come to the perspective of, of saying, you know what, um, I agree with you on this part, on this part. They're going to disagree on something. And let me explain why. Inshallah, in today's discussion, we're going to actually define what secular feminism is. We're going to talk about Islam's stance on feminism. Um, in Islam's stance on uh, femininity. And then inshallah, we're going to also just talk about the hijab and where the hijab comes in with, in regards to feminism. So with that, we will start with 
uh, verse in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul aqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ida jaa nasrullahi wal fatah wa raayta al-nas yadkhuluna fi deen Allah afwaja. Fasabbih bihamdi rabbika wa astaghfir innahu kana tuwa wa sadaqallahu wa yassir. When we discuss feminism and specifically, you know, secular feminism, it's important that we bring into context all of what has actually went into making feminism where it is today. As we know, you know, feminism is only, you could say, in the past, I want to say like 200 years, like it's, 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 it's a fairly new concept. It's not something that's been here for centuries long. It's really just, you know, the past 200 years. In 1848, that's when the first wave of feminism started. You know, and that feminism started for abolishing slavery. It started for women to actually get into the workforce, for women to have the right to vote. And even for that wave of feminism, it actually took them 70 years to get the law set up that women can actually vote. So it wasn't until then, until it wasn't until at that around that time that women can actually achieve that. So there were some legal stances that were actually conquered. 1960s, that's when the second wave of feminism started. And this one was more diverse in a way in which it was fighting more for uh, the female itself, like for the female's body rather than um, for the female in relation to society. So for instance, it was actually focused on more on the birth control, you know, females having the right to actually take birth control, about abortion within limits, um, about anti-sex work. Um, this is where it was focused on, and especially um, about work itself. Now, these first wave and the second wave, there were actually like legal achievements. They did get somewhere within the government. But what's interesting is when we go to look at third wave feminism, right? Third wave feminism focused way more on reproductive uh, system for females. It focused a lot more on the pay gap and gender discrimination. But what's interesting here, and this is where if you look at movies, you'll see that there's a ginormous change in the movies and, and how they're actually talking about women. Women went from being a partner to men to being angry at men. And that happened in the third wave feminism, where anger now started in women that, you know, I not only don't want to be you know, like, I want to be equal to a man, but not only that, I'm angry at a man because he made me not equal to him. And what's really dangerous about this wave of feminism is that this one is what led a lot of women to neglect marriage, to neglect their role in, in their household, to see their job um, as a caretaker uh, or their role as a caretaker as something that's humiliating or something that's not as worthy as, you know, the monetary sense as a man, or to see that them being taken care of by a man as something that's also, you know, not to par with what a man can actually do. The fourth wave of feminism actually started uh, in around 2012. And this one really focused, again, not only about being angry at men, but also about how women are a victim. It almost always made it seem that at every single situation, a woman somehow is always a victim. And it's never to say that, you know what? That's just the situation you're in. You're just gonna have to, you know, just accept it for how it is and just learn to actually work with it. It was never like that. It's always, you're a victim in a certain place. You can do whatever action you wanna do, but the man is never oh, the victim. In my ears. Now, when we talk about secular secular feminism, you know, based on the name in itself, we know what secularism has to do with the lack of religion. The secular religion of feminism really focused on the idea of removing any form of religiosity from feminism itself. And so here, feminism in itself has always had a hate relationship towards religion because in a sense, they always blamed religion for making them where they are today. And, and they kind of do have a right to understand that based if you actually look at Christianity and Catholicism and you look at the history of Catholicism and where women are in relation to, to society, they actually have a, a 
a point. You know, religion in that sense did actually force women to have a lot of disadvantages. And inshallah, we can try and talk about it. But in relationship to Islam, that's completely different. And no one can actually say that a woman does not have rights in Islam. And we'll talk about that inshallah as well. But the idea with secular feminism is that it's really going against the idea of what does it mean for a woman to have agency? What does it mean to have for a woman to have religion for culture? How can a woman have agency if she's in a religion and if she wants to follow feminism? And what does it even mean? Because there are two different things. A lot of females, especially when they're adolescents, they go to school and they learn about feminism. And even though they're Muslims, all of a sudden that same day, they're going to tell you, I'm a feminist, right? And it's such an easy terminology that it really doesn't mean anything anymore. Everyone and anyone can say I'm a feminist and it can mean a thousand things. And like I said in the beginning, you know, um, whoever actually declares himself as a feminist, another woman makes come and say that, no, you're not a feminist in my perspective. I remember once um, I was reading an article uh, and this was, again, when I was studying sociology. And this article talked about how a feminist, a respected feminist in her community, when she got married and when she had kids, was hated by other feminists. Because in their idea, you know, she gave her body to a man. She actually propagated a child. She, she did something um, that was needed from a man. She took something that was needed from a man. And because of this action, she now put herself in a position in which... Uh, you know, she's in servitude to a man or she's in one with a man. And that was something that was against the idea. With secular feminism, it really focused on the idea of let's remove religion from the equation and let's just focus only and solely on the rights of a woman, what a woman wants, what a woman gets. But in reality, it's it's kind of, um, it's the biggest, uh, how can I say? I don't want to say like it's the biggest joke, because I mean, I don't want to disrespect anyone, but it's kind of like you're not talking about the elephant in the room, you know? You're not talking about the fact that a man's the one that built your house. Or if you have a problem with your plumbing, you're going to call for a man to come and fix it for you. Or if you needed something um, out of the ordinary done that you do not have the credentials for, that you're going to call someone and it's most likely going to be a man or a doctor that's going to be a man. So you're always going to be in need of a man. One way or another, you can't remove the idea of a man from being in your life. But in a sense, secular feminism or feminism itself is always saying that we want to be in an equality with men. Now, it's it makes it kind of drives you crazy because there's absolutely no limits to it. Hence, where I, a lot of feminists, right? Even when it comes to having children, they'll just adopt. Well, where do you think that child came from eventually, right? From the from its source, where do you think it was from? As long as how much you actually will make believe that you're free, you're not free from a man, and you can never be free from a man because we work with one of one another it's not possible islam is so much more realistic in a sense where islam will not tell you that i do not favor one or the other islam going to tell you, yes i do favor women or i do favor men within situations within specific situations yes i do favor them there are situations in which i do favor a man as a leader outside of the house and there are situations where i do favor a woman to be a leader within her house a woman cannot become a soldier she can go and fight in the in the jabha, in the in the army, in the work, but in and in Islam, it's not asked of a woman to actually go and make an income and to work in that way. While for you know, for a man it's completely different. It's wajibu to actually go do it. Not only wajibu, he has to go and see how are you living with your household, with your family, and can he actually then take the same income and provide you the same income. So if you had someone that helped you clean the house, he has to also go there and provide you with someone that can clean your house, right? He has to make it at par with what you had in the past. That's what's so interesting and beautiful about this man. Now, I would love to share my screen with you all because I just wanna show you when we talk about secular feminism, when we talk about you know, the idea that women don't have rights in Islam, this is how funny it is because to us, it's like, wow, you finally catched up. Good for you. Let me show you. Let me 
just trying to share my screen here. But it's not coming up with the option. Ms. Minda. Um, let me see. It should, okay. should be at the bottom of the bar. Yeah, no, I, I, I normally use it, but it just Can you, won't come can you up try it again? Try it again now. Is it just not there on your No, it's just it's just not there. It's okay, it's fine. Um what I want to do then instead. Maybe if we make you host, it might work. Uh yeah, that, that should work if you make me host. I think sister if, if you I have I have changed it to um co host. Okay. I'm to just gonna bus. send something inshallah to the chat. No, can you, I can I can I can make you host, but just try it again because I changed the settings just now. Oh yes, yeah, now it worked, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Okay, Bismillah. Okay, amazing. Okay, so inshallah, everyone can see my screen here. Okay, Bismillah. When we look at secular feminism and you know Islam, Islam in itself, you're talking about centuries ago ago thousands of centuries ago islam since nami muhammad came and started to speak about the religion of islam he started with the idea that a woman is equal to a man as a person as an individual this is where feminism got the, it wrong they said oh a woman so is equal to a man that means she's equal in absolutely everything that means she's equal in how she works in the workforce or she's equal with her rights in her body right islam said no Islam said you are equal as a person, as an individual. What does that mean? That means like, you know, when your teacher wanted to make sure that you didn't want to, you didn't cheat in a math test. So she had two versions of a test. They're the same exact questions, but the numbers on those questions are different. Some of them had two plus two equals four, and some of them had five plus five, right? It didn't matter. At the end of the day, you were doing simple addition. But the fact is, is that the teacher did not want you to cheat from the person beside you. And so they wanted to give you a different version of the test. In a sense, that's what we can see what Allah did. Allah gave us a version of a test for females. And he gave males a version of a test for males. We're still going to go through the same uh, issues, the same problems, but in different ways that match our body, that match our individuality. Islam always said that you can't blame a woman for a sin what's this referring to remember how i told you that christianity you know they did actually um put females in a negative stance from the beginning that's true for christianity they blamed eve for the original sin and because they blamed eve for the original sin that sin that a woman is the one that speaks to the devil carried on that idea carried on. And so from generation to generation, it was always thought of as a woman is closer to the devil compared to a man is closer to the devil. And if anyone here actually watches horror movies, I'm a big horror movie fanatic. I love horror movies, even though I'm, I'm, I'm very scared to even sleep alone. Um, but if anyone here watches horror movies, you'll always notice that it's always the little girl that speaks to the devil first or the woman that gets impacted by the devil first and it's rarely ever the man seriously it's rarely ever the man it will maybe be a little boy but a man itself being the first person is is kind of unseen in horror movies and that's again because the idea is that a woman is closer to the devil uh, based on christianity while in islam it will actually tell you that no it was neither eve nor adam that first did it they did it together that's islam's perspective in Islam, we know that Sayyida Khadija used to buy property, used to sell property. She had a lot of wealth that was hers. She would get inherited money from her father. She had all of these. While again, let's see to what we talked about with Western civilization. You know, it wasn't until 1870 that a woman got a married woman's property act. 
It wasn't until 1918 that a woman can actually vote. It wasn't until, you know, the 1957 of the Treaty of Rome, which included the principle of equal pay. All of these in Western civilization, which is quote unquote more developed than, Isl than Islamic civilization, all of them are supposedly more advanced than us. And when a simple, incredible, perfect man, such as Nabi Muhammad, peace be upon him, so Allah sallam, Muhammad, Muhammad, a man like him came along and said, you know what, you shouldn't kill women alive. You should allow the woman to be equal. You're not allowed to hit her. You're not allowed to leave her. You have to provide for her financial. You have to take care of her emotionally. You have to secure her. You can't hurt her with any harsh words. If she brings a child for you, you take care of her. And she has rights now. All of this came from a man in a, in a desert. And yet the people of a Western civilization that's so advanced, literally only 200 years ago started to think, hey, it's actually important that a woman is treated in a sense of equality. Now, where does this all come? We know that Islam has no favor in the sense of favorism, like a woman needs to uh, my apologies. We know, we understand from Islam that a woman's role, like her servitude to her husband, a lot of feminists will look at that servitude and say, well, that's exactly what we're talking about. That's the issue. The issue with us is that you actually obey your husband or you listen to your husband. What's exactly wrong with listening or obeying someone that's your leader? A lot of women are, are really, they're very uh, comical, in my opinion, these feminists. They don't mind listening to their uh, manager, if it's a man, and obeying whatever he needs. You know, by next Tuesday, you need to have this handed in, even though she has to stay up, even though she has to lose some time from here, or she has to put in the extra effort, whatever it is. She, in a sense, you're still obeying. That's what obeying is, is, is accepting and tolerating and, and listening. They don't mind listening to it if it's a man, but if it's a worker, you know, because they're getting paid. But if it's your spouse, who's your partner in life, who is the father of your children, who's the one that's going to take care of you in sickness and, and health and, in, you know, until death do us apart, the one that's taking care of you, that's the person that they have an issue with and obeying. Make that make sense. This person is your partner. He's seen you in your worst. He's seen you in ways that no one else has seen you. And you're going to come and tell us that we should not obey our husband? The sense here, it's because it's the understanding of what obeying means. Obeying doesn't mean that you tolerate um, any aggression towards you. It doesn't mean that you tolerate any abuse towards you. It doesn't mean that you are forced to do anything you don't want to do. Islam gives you the right that if he's doing something to you, that Islam would not accept that you do not listen to him. Or that, for instance, uh, something like uh, a woman, uh, there's something in Islam where there's two uh, obligatory things from a woman to a man. Two things. Number one is that she obeys him in a sense in which whenever he wants physical intimacy that she provides to him. That's the first one. And the second one is that she does not leave the house without her, without her husband's permission. The second one, or the first as well, you know, a woman, if she doesn't listen, if she doesn't obey to these two things, she would be considered a nashiza. A nashiza is someone that's uh, very looked down upon in Islam. But let's say, for instance, that there was harm on her either for the first one, that there was physical harm, like her body was ill, or for the second one, that maybe she was afraid that her husband was going to hit her and she wanted to leave the house, or that the environment in the house wasn't safe and she wanted to leave the house. In both cases, a woman wouldn't be considered a nashiza if she didn't obey to these things. Because Islam, over everything, will always, always, always prioritize a woman in her dignity, a woman in uh, her rights. And it will also prioritize in making sure that a woman is safe, or even a man. It will come down to the anything. Like for instance, if if there's humility in you um, having water to do a duel, or let's say for instance, that you were um, to get to that water, you might be killed in any case, right? Islam will tell you, don't do a go do tayammu. Why? Because it takes care of the soul and the nafis from humility and from um, anything that's going to harm you. 
And so in the same sense, Islam will always prioritize that you're safe, that you're dignified, and that you're okay. But let's say that you're, all those are, are, are good. He's not abusive. He's, he's not doing these things. Now Islam does a, a very interesting things. It says that I want you to take on a specific role that is good for who you are as an individual. And I want the man to take on a specific role that is amazing and that will lighten them up as a man. And these things are, what's really hilarious is if you've noticed recently on Instagram or even TikTok, uh, even though I don't follow TikTok, but I know that they, it's getting spread around a lot. Right now, uh, there is this trend that's women reconnecting with their femininity. Have you guys seen it? Where they are now staying at home, they're now baking. They're now cleaning. They're providing their husband when he comes home with a warm meal. And they're talking about it on Instagram like it's a new revelation. And if you see the comment section, it's absolutely hilarious. It's like, why would you do that to yourself? You're putting yourself, you're setting yourself up for failure. When he divorces you, when he cheats on you, when he does this, when he does this. It's so interesting. Because these women are talking about how happy they are. How much they're happy to not be in the workforce anymore and to just rely on him to bring in the money. And in Islam, it's like we've been doing this and we've been asking for this and supporting this thought, right? In this day and age, yes, it is important for a woman to have an education, 100%. A woman should never, ever, ever not have an education. It's mandatory. When it comes to work, that's a different situation. If a man can actually provide and he can actually give, there's absolutely no reason that a woman should have to work unless it's something where, um, you know, emotionally or psycho like psychologically, like some women can't stay at home. They just really feel choked up if they're always at home. If there's an actual form of harm on you, of course, by all means do it. But at that moment, you got to recognize where your priorities are. Your priority is very important. If your priority is your work, then you're going to hold off having children or making your children first to serve your ego, to serve yourself. Because in this sense, you don't need to work. Your husband's fully capable to work. And his body is in such a way where he can have children and literally be okay the next day. He doesn't have an influence on himself. But a woman, if she's going to have a child for the next nine months, her body is in, is in pain. After the nine months, for the next two years, it takes her for her hormonal balance to actually come back to normal. And then every single day after that, it takes her a lot of work and effort, either by breastfeeding or going back to her, and her natural body or menstruation. And then let's say again, she's going to have a second child and a third child. Realistically speaking, a woman that's having a child or bearing children is going to be serving so much more time and effort towards that child than the man. It doesn't matter how much the man is actually helping you out in the house or whatever it is. At the end of the day, your body is working at a different pace than the man. Because a woman has a lunar schedule with how her she's menstruating, but a man has a solar, right? It just goes up and down with this, like the sun. In the morning, he's at his highest peak with hormones. And at the latest time, he's uh, much more tired. But with, um, with a woman, she's different in the beginning of her cycle. She's different in the middle. She's different at the end. If we try and pretend to be equal to a man, you're just going to be uh, laughing at yourself because what feminism did was a man was taking care of her for the longest time with a very good pay. There was something called a family wage pay. And this actually was in the 1960s. It was a family wage pay, meaning that whatever job a man had, it was enough for him to feed his wife, to feed his child, children, and to feed himself. Family wage pay. But then that changed. Why did it change? Because females now started in the workforce. When females started in the workforce, they were like, okay, well, now the women are working. This is actually good for us. We can pay the woman less and she'll accept. And she's actually a harder working 
person than the man. So we actually enjoy her to work even more. Every single thing that feminism has conquered, you know, there are good things that it has conquered within society. But of course, Islam had already provided this for society. But every other thing that Islam, uh, that feminism had conquered in society, it came to serve the needs of men even more than it did come to serve the needs of females. So when we look at feminism, it was saying that, you know, I have the right to show my body in whatever way I want to show it. I have the right to be in whatever, um, in whatever look I would actually prefer to be, right? If I want to wear cleavage or uh, free the nipple or, or whatever it is, I have the right to do that. And a man should not feel aroused or he should not feel anything and instead he should just you know uh kindly uh, look away or just be in his own perspective or even talk to me but just nothing can happen it's it's so unrealistic when in islam it says a woman's body is for her husband in a sense where it recommends a woman to be with her husband but at the same time it also says and asks a man to not look at other women to lower his gaze with other women, to respect a woman. That's his form of hijab. And so what we see here is feminism literally gave pleasure to a man by creating this Hollywood style of a woman. It also encouraged a woman to be working in a workforce. And so now she's somehow uh, supporting a man because now she's putting in uh, more time and effort and she's taking on the job that a man should have already taken on which is provide for the family and what do you think uh the government or the society is going to talk about that they're not going to be sad about that they're going to be happy you know a woman is coming and saying that she's going to show more cleavage and she's going to work for me that's actually great let's take that on so in reality, when we talk about feminism, they didn't necessarily, especially when I'm talking about here is the third and, and fourth wave feminism, they didn't necessarily conquer anything, especially not in the legal force. Because in a sense, they're just saying that we should have the right to be and do whatever we want. And no one's allowed to, again, um, blame them as a victim or say anything about them. Now, I, before I move to the segment of the hijab, are there any questions up until here? Um, I have a question. Of course, go ahead. Um, so how, like, th this is something that I actually really resonate with because I, I think I grew up with this idea of being a career woman and kind of seeking that lifestyle that we're taught is, you know, this whole, like, feminist movement and how that's freedom. Um, and it only took me till, like, about two, three years ago for me to realise, actually, that's that's not what I want um, and to kind of be more receptive to the Islamic um version of femininity so how how do you advise that we like raise our daughters and our younger children in a way that they are more receptive because it's something that I I you know I tried to have these conversations with my younger sister or like people in my like put circle but it's just sometimes I feel like do they need to go through like what I did where you know they go through their life journey to re recognize it or is there something that we can do to educate them so that they're able to kind of make that decision early on and recognize that this is actually freedom um yeah that's a very beautiful question um i was sitting with a friend and uh, she someone had asked her you know so that someone had asked her children who was about five or six i think i believe six she asked her child she was like you know what do you want to be when you grow up and the girl literally proudly said i want to become a mother that's her response i want to become a mother and I think in this in this sense, it was really special because firstly, everyone in the audience gasped, like they just did not expect that because you don't expect anymore a girl to want to become a mother or to want to become a wife anymore. Our uh, mothers, since they were really impacted with the third wave feminism, we will hear a lot from our mothers, unfortunately, from that generation, complain about um, their role as a mother. So what they'll say is, you know, like, what am I, a servant to you guys? Or I don't do anything. I gave up 
everything for you. I sacrifice my education. I sacrifice this for you. And you're living your life right now, you know, as all of us went to university and studied and did all that and work. Why is that? It's because they lost the vision of what it is that they're actually doing. And what Islam does is Islam says that I want you to look at all these holy women that I've laid out for you. Okay. So we can look at Asya, Sayyidah Asya, the wife of Pharaoh, who was married to the most powerful, richest man at his time. The most powerful. Okay. I want you to then look at Sayyidah Maryam, who her mother had dedicated Sayyidah Maryam to be in service to Allah. She literally, her mother literally said, the, per, the child that's in, my, in, in me, I want it to serve you. Okay, and all, she had expected a man because she expected that a man would only be able to serve God. And what did God do? He said he gave her a woman. And then she said, you know, I told you that I want her to save you. How is she going to serve you? And God, of course, here was had more knowledge than she did. And so what we see in the Quran is that there's multiple different versions of what a successful woman can look like. Some women were a wife. Some women were uh, a mother, such as Sayyidah Maryam. Some women, like Sayyidah Khadija, Khadija, was a businesswoman and was a supporter of Islam. You know, it, Nabi Muhammad said, if it were not for Sayyidah Khadija's wealth and Imam Ali's sword, Islam would not survive until today. Some women were like Sayyidah Fatima, who was the embodiment of what a woman and a daughter should be, especially a daughter. You know, Umm Abiha. Some women are like Sayyidah Zainab, who in a sense was a leader because Imam Zainab Abidin was still sick. And so she had a period of, of being the leader between it. Every single woman we look at reflected something completely different than another one. And that's what really gets to me when a lot of women, you know, are look at their position in society and they kind of feel so dismayed. Like I'm not fulfilling my role like anyone else. Why is this important? Because our children don't understand this. They don't understand that there's no one version of a woman and that you can't actually achieve um, this success in only trying to copy and mimic one another. Our children need to understand that Islam was the first religion to ever provide equality. You know, it did provide it within Judaism and Christianity, but Judaism, Judaism and Christianity, they changed it. They morphed it. It's not the real holistic religion. No, Islam is the first religion to provide equality. Not only that, equality isn't what Islam focuses on. Equality is, for us, is kind of like equality of the body. Like you can't harm each other. But Islam doesn't say that a man and a woman are equal in a sense of... Um, uh, it doesn't say that a woman and a man should eat the same amount. It would be unfair for me to say that I should get the same pro uh, portion of protein as my husband. His body needs more. You know, physiologically speaking, he has more blood than me. He has bigger uh, body parts than me. His heart is bigger than mine. Everything about a man is subhanAllah different than a woman. If you just want to sit down the child and just let them explore physiologically how different the man and the woman are, psychologically how different, make it an activity and just analyze it based on the social aspect, the psychology aspect. Fun fact, a woman can prefers a job that's more social. Hence why a woman becomes a nurse, why she becomes a secretary, why she becomes uh, a doctor, uh, my apologies, um, a teacher, while a man, he prefers a job that just gets money and just does, you know, just does it, just does it successfully, just is able to get the most money. So that's why for him, he doesn't mind being a truck driver. He can drive in a car for 12 hours and he'll come home and he's perfectly fine. But for a woman, put her in a car for 12 hours and she'll feel like crazy. Like I haven't spoken to anyone. I feel so choked, Right. When we teach our children from a young age, all of these, that naturally we're different, okay? This in itself makes them question, like, what are you telling me then that women and men are equal? Equal based on what? What is feminism even fighting for? Like, there's no clear basis. If you have these conversations with the child, give them the space to come to a decision on their own. 
but at least you sped it up in a way in which they're not glamorizing what it means to be a feminist because it's just glamorized at this point. It's just another word. Um, so hopefully uh, that explains um, things. I mean, uh, hopefully, inshallah. Are there any other questions before we move off to the other segment? Okay, bismillah. So when we talk about um, the hijab and feminism, everything in Islam is a pre-decided, I don't want to only say pre-decided, but is a constructed ideology in which it serves the females in one way and it serves the males in a different way. If we look at how a woman um, or a man is, a man, when he sees a woman that's beautiful, he may feel aroused, right? Because he saw something beautiful. But a female, she doesn't ever get aroused by looking at a beautiful man. She gets aroused when she makes the man aroused in her. So in a sense, a woman is very egocentric, narcissistic, because she only got happy that a man wanted her. Is that clear? Her happiness or her love for herself right now was only achieved because another man desired her. Now, this can be in like multiple layers. It can be between her and her husband. But where does it become haram? Where a woman uses this, not only between a halal spouse, but maybe in society. Her wanting to be desired by other men in society. Because this gives her the position in which she now feels like, okay, I am beautiful. Okay, I, I am wanted. Oh, look, I am something. That's why for a lot of women that, I don't want to say find it difficult for the hijab, because even women that wear the hijab, they still do this mistake, unfortunately, where for a lot of women, they've put themselves in a position in which the hijab is, you know, it's not as if it's even there anymore. It's just the idea of her using the hijab to her advantage so that she can um, feel better about herself. For a woman, she will naturally feel better about herself and feel like she's um, beautiful if she's desired. But what is Islam asking of us? Islam is asking, you see that emotion that you have of feeling desired with a man or maybe even feeling desired in society. I want you to tame it. And I want you to tell yourself that instead of feeling desired by a man, you want to, in a sense, say that I want to give up this so that I can be desired by Allah. In a way, of course, that's different than everyone else, but in a way in which we say that Allah wants us to be in Jannah. Or Allah wants me to be with amongst those that are pure. When a woman decides to wear the hijab, she is giving up her beauty. We can't come and say that a woman becomes more beautiful in a physiological sense. It's, it's not true. We're lying to ourselves. No, a woman is actually prettier without her hijab. She's gorgeous without her hijab. Come and tell me, all of us are hijab, like all of us know a hijabi who the minute she takes off her hijab, mashallah, you know, her hair, everything about her is just her complexion. Everything about her is just astounding. It's like, you can't even believe that that's how she looks with the, with the hijab on. We all know that. So no one can come and say or lie that, no, I, I'm more beautiful with your hijab. No, it's it's just natural for a woman to be more beautiful without hijab. It's That's how God created you. He created you a perfect being, a beautiful being. With, without it, your hair is the most beautiful feature in you. And not only your hair, your body parts. All of that is asked by Allah to be covered. Now, where is that other beauty, that sense of beauty that we can all feel in our heart? Well, that comes through the iman. That comes through what the, what, what the eyes cannot see. 
right? Uh, there's that quote that says the, uh, the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? That the beauty that we see is somehow touched from the heart, that we can see someone and we can say that that person is beautiful because of that. When we talk about the hijab, the hijab was asked to come into our life so that it can tame and control what we would like for others to have control over us. So Islam is saying, I don't want you to give this control to anyone and to keep it to yourself and to only keep it within um, a limited, very uh, concentrated environment. And within this environment, you will be freer and you will be more special and you will be able to give us more. The hijab is liberating because it allows a woman to know and to choose how much she's going to give someone. Not only that, obeying and listening to Allah is liberating because we all listen to someone. A feminist is gonna to listen to the government and the government is mainly male, but a feminist is going to live and to listen to a government. She's going to say, you know what? You're right, I have to pay my taxes by April. I have to do this, I have to do that. She won't at all um, disagree. And so what's the difference with Islam when it comes with a, where Islam is supposed to be a governed government religion, such as we have in Iran, it's supposed to be a government religion, right? And it's supposed to say that, well, now you can come and say that you can achieve, um, you can achieve wearing the hijab and you can achieve uh, the inheritance right and you can achieve so-and-so because that's just how Islam is. When we talk about um, Islam, it's really important to understand that Islam is a religion based on rules and regulations. And to be a Muslim means to be submissive, means to salim umrik, means that you recognize that I have to give up my beauty and be in a reserved, conserved environment because that is what's better for society. That's what's better for me. It's better for society because it controls society in a sense where it's not just all foda. All the men are looking at women and all the women are showing off themselves to haram men. And it's better for a woman herself because she controls her beauty. She controls what she sees as um, her most important aspect and she controls it in that way. Are there any questions, inshallah, um, so far? Chivalry, exactly. Um, another one would be bravery, right? Like he needs to be, he needs to have that characteristic of strength. And if a man doesn't have this, imagine if a man just hides behind you or just expects you, you you tell him you're not a man. You're not, you're not in the nature that you're supposed to be. For a woman, haya is one of the most important characteristics to a point where. A man might go and do something with a woman, um, but he won't marry her if he did that with a woman because he doesn't want that person as his wife. Maybe it's for entertainment, but it wouldn't be that he wants that for a wife. Does that make sense? Because as a wife, he considers that that's something that he wouldn't want his child, children to do or his, or his daughter to do, of course not. Hayat is the most characteristic of a female. But as we know from feminism, feminism worked specifically on the idea of removing Hayat from females, of making sure that she feels so liberated to show whatever body part or wherever she wants to do um, without any fear of where it's going to take her, of her personality. Right, most of the musicians we see right now in this day and age, they'll tell themselves they're they're uh, they'll say that I'm a feminist, but at the same time, they'll literally be wearing absolutely nothing and say that as a feminist, I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to show whatever body part I want, and this is something that you have to control. I can't. I don't need to control this for you. This inner haya, it doesn't come out of nowhere. This inner haya has to be grown and fostered from something. And it's fostered actually from a young age. 
when we teach our children from a young age to start wearing more modestly, especially before her, she wears the hijab, to start wearing more modestly, you know, like at seven years old, she shouldn't be wearing a miniskirt anymore, um, to start wearing more modestly. And then over that, to teach them to start to respect their bodies with boundaries, start to understand who to speak to and who they shouldn't be speaking to. And then more than that, this hayat has to come from them themselves, that they know that there is a boundary and restriction between them and a man. And that it's not okay for them to play in the same manner as tag or whatever it is that they used to, because now they are at a different age rank. They're in a different um, life. These are all foundations and are very important um, for the children to know. So Haya isn't something that grows overnight. It's something that you actually build as a parent. And then it's something that you foster. So for instance, I wear that, I started wearing Abiyaros recently, right? To me, before I'd wear color deshars. And recently, um, especially when I was traveling in the airport, I'm not going, I'm not about to go and wear a black and we stopped in London, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that, like, it's just, I don't feel safe at all, so I had to go back to, like, one of my colored hijabs, and I felt so uncomfortable doing that, even though it's something I've been doing for, you know, the past 20 years of my life, but I felt so uncomfortable, because I'm just, like, I, I literally put myself in a position where all I want to do is wear black, and I'm, I'm comfortable with it, and I'm happy with it, and that form of haya is something that you grow with, you know, for instance, some people might be okay with them uh, sitting in a room with a man or a doctor alone. But when you start to tell yourself like, no, that hayat has to happen where I'm not in a room alone with a man, no matter who he is. When you start to learn like that, it starts to become difficult for you to go back to old patterns or old habits because you start to question where it is that I could have been more in a boundary. Um, there's one narration that actually says that the best of women are the women that cover their face like no one actually sees her face and the idea between that is that 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 level of hayat that no one can actually see her is of the best because it's it's that much that's how much hayat as, of islam is actually asking from us and that's what's very interesting of course it can't be uh put into every single situation that a woman hides herself um in that sense and that's not a conversation i'm trying to get into but what i'm trying to say is that hayat is something that is fostered, that is questioned, like where is it that I should have extra hayat or put in more effort? And it's something that you work on. You need to put in the actual effort, uh, active effort to do, inshallah. Are there any questions uh, before we end off, inshallah, for today's gathering? Hello. You have social media, Ayana. Um, obviously, it's not physical. It's kind of writing, chatting. Um, so perhaps maybe you can touch on the fact that um, how far should our youngsters go towards chatting on so social media? And sometimes they say it's for education or for um, just knowing things. So there is a, a big social hijab difficulty now as well, a challenge, right? Yeah, sorry, sister. What do you mean um, with uh, getting to know things? What What did you mean? So sister? sometimes they're, they're discussing, having discussion, you know, maybe a religious discussion or um, anything online. But it's actually really maybe not necessary, if I may say so. So um, today, a lot of a lot of the youngsters are saying, but we're just having a chat with them online. I see. So at, at the end of the day, um, we want to make sure that I think a lot of our parents, what they did a very big mistake was they really made a lot of girls afraid of talking to men, right? To the point where men and women were segregated in society in mosques. And a lot of men then turned towards a uh, white woman to get married to them because they just didn't find anyone in their community or they didn't like them because they didn't get to know them. So at times and places, it's actually really, really important, specifically when we can have a, a constructed environment like if a mosque can actually have a gathering where men and women can come to an event and they can you know maybe a man will be interested in a woman actually want to get to know her within a constructed environment so that marriage can eventually and hopefully happen um so chats online within a very restricted or 
um, practiced environment, it's it's important. It's good. It's good that um, a man or a woman, especially if they're single, to actually talk to one another and to actually see um, where their interests are. However, if it's not going to lead anywhere, that's where the issue is. Let's say, for instance, it's not actually going to lead to marriage or it's not going to actually lead to a place where this man and this woman are going to at that point, no, of course, these meaning, meaningless conversations are going to impact the woman because she's going to um, put maybe, you know, her goal or her intention towards someone that's uh, not right. And it's going to impact the man because now he thinks that he can just uh, play with anyone or, or anything. So social media is obviously a very big issue, especially with with how many people will post an image and just not really care about whether or not anyone else is um, getting influenced by that image or what they may think about this image, etc. Um, Sister Zahra had a question uh, for an unmarried woman, how to suppress the need for attention from men? That's a very, very good question, especially as an unmarried woman. I want to tell you a, a, a quick story from my house. There's a girl who was about 26 years old. She decided and that she wanted to wear the niqab. She was unmarried. Okay. She decided she wanted to wear the niqab. So a full covering of her face. And this was at the time of COVID. So she did. She wore the niqab. She was unmarried. Doesn't talk to men completely segregated she went to the hausa and when she was in the hausa which is all women again no men nothing like that uh there was someone that saw her a woman that saw her and got interested in her and told her son and they met and now she's married what was really interesting about this is that the woman put in the effort to become closer to allah and Allah told her, you know what? You put in the effort. That's great. Now I'm going to take care of your marriage for you. I'm going to literally send someone to ask for your hand. And you, you don't have to do anything. Absolutely nothing. What was really nice about that is there's a client of mine once who told me that her parents are forbidding her. Because, of course, I work with a lot of girls that want to wear the hijab or want to take off the hijab. And her parents were forbidding her to uh, wear the hijab until she's married. Because they literally put in the power in her beauty rather than Allah. Saying that, you know, you're beautiful right now. And so if you're beautiful right now, if you wear the hijab, you're not going to be as beautiful. No one's going to want to marry you. And unfortunately, she's still, you know, at that, at that time, it was, it was still unfortunate that she didn't actually find the right partner. But alhamdulillah, from herself, she found it within herself to actually wear the hijab. With a girl who sees that, you know, the attention of a man, there's good attention and there's bad attention. If you want to get attention from a man that's arousing, that's haram attention. You don't want to ever get there. And you don't want to make sure you don't ever wear anything that will get its attention like that. But if you want to get his attention in the sense where he finds you as a pious, dignified woman, that's different. That's, that's attention that's good. That's your character. So it depends on what attention it is. Uh, someone also has a question. How should a woman deal with a husband who is not so religious and with bad morals? That's an unfortunate, unfortunate, unfortunate one. Um, because typically Islam tells you not to even marry someone that has bad morals. And of course, sometimes we don't really know about them until after marriage. But Islam tells you to completely even avoid marriage. As important as marriage is, it says to completely avoid marriage if it's going to be a marriage like that. Um, Sayyidah Asya, the wife of Pharaoh, she was married to a terrible man. Yet, what did she do? She prayed to Allah. And she asked Allah, Oh Allah, please build for me a house in Jannah. Make for me a house beside you in Jannah. And she was patient with her husband, with her spouse. Now, unfortunately, you know, this has to go back to you. How much is this impacting you? How much is it impacting your children? Do you have children? Um, if it's something that maybe you'd like to look into for divorce or not, it's not that, you know, someone would encourage divorce, but in the end of the day, Islam never made divorce forbidden for a reason. 
because you want to make sure that this you want to make sure you're strong enough to actually not be impacted I, for instance i know someone who they the spouse doesn't pray and because the spouse doesn't pray the other spouse stopped praying as well so this person not only impacted herself but she also impacted the spouse that she's with that's why it's very important that you ask yourself to what degree can you actually accept being with a spouse that um, can't provide you with the support that you need? And do you really want someone that if they're saying they're not going to change and you have to accept them for who they are to be the father of your children? I believe that's all the questions um, for today. Was there any other Okay, we just received one. In recent years, I feel we've been seeing an increasing number of men marrying outside the Muslim community. Yes, that's true. Or simply that they only want a wife who is without a hijab. This has led to an increasing number of women left unmarried in our communities. What can we do as a community to support our women find appropriate partners uh, to create uh, opportunities for marriage? I, I see it so much as someone who travels. The amount of women I know that are absolute gems. They are gems. Like whoever man gets them, is so lucky to have them as a wife, as a mother, as an individual, as a partner. And it's so unfortunate for people like that to not be connected with someone else. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, what can we do to actually change this? That's a huge question because it has to go down to the community. It has to go down to how um, men and women are actually interacting in society, you know, from a young age or from an older age. Are they may waiting to get married after university? Like a lot of parents actually tell their daughter. Um, it's really funny. Like they should be able to meet the guy in university or high school, but they tell them, no, 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 no. Meet him after you're done from university and high school. And that's like literally when there's no more men that you're going to actually be talking to. That's from the, from your same field. Um, there's a lot to question about that. But what I really want you to focus on um, is, is that the society we're in right now is not like any other society or any other time. Marriage is very different now. The playing field for marriage is very different right now. And what that means is that marriage right now is going to ask from you to work on yourself a lot more than it ever has before. In the past, a woman might marry a man and he's just of these characters and she'll just have to accept it. But now it's like, no, if you're not of these characters that I want, we'll have a divorce and we'll get from there. So what I really recommend a lot of women to do is really work on themselves. Of course, have to work with Allah and whatever society is going to tell you is, is for the better, like to be married, um, but to take off the hijab to be married is absolutely ridiculous. Because at the end of the day, your marriage might be successful, not might not be successful. He might die the next day. You might die the next day. And where are you going to go? You can go back to Allah. It's like, who are you really uh, trying to fool here in your pleasure, right? I've seen recently who say that this is a question who wants a woman to contribute 50 50 to the household um i would rather raise my and nurture my children and this doesn't work for them realistically with the finance in the uk what do you advise then they also say if you want to raise and nurture your children listen to the islamic way then you are also ready to uh, accept me having multiple ways Multi I, mean, I i suppose that this is multiple wives okay if he can have multiple wives, then he can actually afford <laughs> having you <laughs> as a stay-at-home mom. So that doesn't make sense. If he can actually afford to have a multiple wife, like, who is he fooling? Like, you should be able to afford to provide for me and to provide for her if you actually want to have a multiple wife. Um, like, you, you want to have a multiple wife, please go ahead and have a multiple wife, but please just provide for me in the first place. And then also she's going to ask you to provide for her because she's not going to work if... I'm not working. She's going to be want to be pampered like me. So let him figure that out. If he wants to do that, let him go that route. But there's a lot of barakah 
a lot of good deeds that go to a woman that contributes to the household. There's a lot of barakat. But if you are going to provide 50-50, then a man has to provide 50-50 in the household. He has to. He has to also be cooking. He has to also be cleaning. He has to also be doing these things. Because it's unrealistic that you're going to come back from your job at 3, 4, 5, and you're going to contribute to the house or whatever it is. Um, so when we talk about that 50-50, especially in UK, you guys have unrealistic prices here. Oh, my God. But Canada is really expensive as well. Um, but when you come and talk about how the situation is here, the next question is, okay, let's move somewhere that's more realistic. Let's find a better home. Let's let's get somewhere else. Because honestly, after someone that lives in Lebanon for the past close to eight years of my life, living in a country where your rent is only barely a, a speck of your income. Here, your rent is literally more than what your income is. Like it, you can't even afford to buy a house. You can't afford to do anything with 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 paying all of this debt um and so at the end of the day yes uk is very expensive but a woman's role is not that no man should come and ask or force a woman to do something that she's not comfortable with especially when she prefers to be a nurse or stay at home mom that's her right that's where she wants to be if she can do something for sabili and actually try and contribute in a certain amount sure but it's no force or obligation on her. So it's either that they accept the lower amount of standard that they're going to be in, or it's either he's going to have to put in more effort, which hopefully he would, or it's either that he, she's going to go and work, but now he has to also come and compensate her with working and worth making sure that he understands that this is a favor that she is doing to him. And it's not something obligatory whatsoever. Um, inshallah, uh, we'll uh, close it with this last question. Um, was Fat say the Fatima the Zara and say the Zainab active in society in front of men? Um, they were active in front of men when they were needed to be. So, for instance, say the Fatima was very active um, when the land of Fadak was taken away from her and when Imam Ali was stripped away from the Khalifa. She would actually go around and tell people of that she was the daughters of the prophet and that the right of it was to Imam Ali, she would actually go and she was one of the first to go and propagate that this was incorrect and that Imam Ali and Zalam, hence why she was killed. So we know that Sayyidah Fatima would actually propagate this and talk about this very verbally in society when it was needed. Uh, we know also Sayyidah Zainab um, would, uh, when she was taken to Sayyidah, to, when she was taken to Yazid, um, she spoke very openly, very vibrantly uh, to Yazid and made every single person there who had believed that Yazid was doing a good thing by killing Imam Hussein uh, question Yazid and uh, force Yazid to actually let them go free. So within a specific case and situation, yes, they were active. It's just about knowing when you shouldn't, when you shouldn't be active. That's what's very important. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you so much, um, you know, Lantern of Light, uh, for hosting this. Um, you guys are doing such an incredible job. May Allah reward you endlessly for your efforts. Um, it's never easy to say that I want to come and do something for Islam, but you guys are doing such a noble uh, job. And I really do pray that you only find success in your future work. And success is, of course, never monetary. It's never with how many followers or how many likes or whatever it is. It's with what you do um, and just doing for the sabilillah and just leaving it there, never expecting anything in return. Um, thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate it. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact me directly on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. Um, as you said, um, like we're so very grateful to have you here. And the work that you do, may Allah always bless you and your loved ones and your family and give you the strength to continue to, to be of service to him, inshallah. And, Thank you so much. Um, and may all our intentions remain pure um, when, when we serve. Thank you everyone for joining the session. Um, I hope that you all benefited from it as much as I benefited. Um, and inshallah, we can be those women, inshallah, that 
nurture our daughters and our sisters and our who are all the lovely women and women and girls in our community to be feminine and uh, Muslim women, inshallah. Um, inshallah. We, um, just before we finish, we'll just uh, recite Dua al-Faraj, inshallah, um, and then we can wrap up, inshallah. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma kulli waliyika hujjat ibn al-Hassan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih fi hadihi sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a waliyan wa hafidha wa qa'idhan wa nasira wa dalilan wa ayna hatta tuskinuhu adhaka ta'a wa tumata'ahu fiha tawila bi rahmatik ya rahman rahim. Thank you so much, everyone. May this Ramadan be blessed for all of you. Inshallah, Allah yitqabal a'malakum. Um, and uh, see you soon, inshallah, um, at the next Lantern of Light session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.